Since we're a, a little more intimate group uh, each week as we gather, we'll probably take just a few more seconds, uh, a few more moments uh, to offer peace to one another. Um, so just kind of know going forward, there might be an extended sharing of the peace uh, here. And, and the idea, of course, is, is not only to, uh, uh, to share the peace of the Lord with one another, but also to get to know each other a little bit better. We've got some name tags, uh, and we invite you to, to put on a name tag when you come in or have a name tag. Um, it's not the social hour, uh, but it definitely is a time for us to make some more connections. I know many of you uh, have been worshiping together, uh, maybe even for many years, uh, in the same building, uh, but have never really gotten to know each other, maybe from a different service. And so this might be an opportunity uh, to establish uh, some face connections a little bit more. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, a bit later. This morning, I see many of you brought your Bibles, and last week I challenged you uh, to bring your Bibles. Or if you want to uh, look at the scripture text on your cellular mobile, that is perfectly fine as well. Um, we will always put the scripture text up on the screen. And uh, this morning, as John mentioned, we're going to be in Matthew 4, where Jesus is calling the disciples. And I'm not going to read it just yet. Uh, so go ahead and go to Matthew 4, uh, verse 18, uh, and we'll get there in just a moment. Uh, let us bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Oh, God, we thank you for a new day. We thank you, Lord, for the rain that falls to the earth, which offers refreshment, which offers new life to grow. God, we pray this morning that we too would experience refreshment and growth as we look to your word, as we look to you, Father, as the one, the author and the sustainer of all life. God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've been attending Faith Lutheran Church the past few weekends, you know that we've been doing a discipleship sermon series. And a disciple is simply someone who follows Jesus. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. And we have really based this first sermon series on the words of Matthew 28. The Great Commission to go and make disciples. And I think it's interesting and I think it's powerful and poignant that the last commandment of Jesus to make disciples is the first priority of Faith Lutheran Church. The last commandment, go and make disciples, is the first priority of Faith Lutheran Church. And so as we think about what it means to make disciples, oftentimes we think to ourselves, well, how do we do that? What exactly does it mean to make disciples? What is the methodology? How do we even do this? How can this even happen? And I'm reminded on that day when Jesus stood before probably just a few dozen people and said, go and make disciples. They heard those words and there were just a few dozen people there. But they began to make disciples and the church began to grow. We read in Acts 2 that the church pretty soon hit about 3,000 people. It was growing as they were making more and more disciples. In the year 1000 AD, there were about 25,000 people now in the church. And historians tell us that in the year 350 AD, shortly after Christianity became legal, there were now more than 25 million Christians. The church absolutely exploded of people making disciples. How did that happen? That the church grew so big in such a short amount of time, especially when to be a follower of Christ was illegal. It meant persecution and oftentimes jail, torture, death. It's because I think the people actually believe Jesus' words to make disciples. They were serious about this commandment that Jesus offered on that day to go and make disciples. Now we see in the church today, the Chinese church has the same mentality of making disciples. In 1950, 
there were one million Christians in China. By 1994, there were 75 million, and today there are over 100 million Christians in China today. And that's according to the state-run media of China. The church has absolutely exploded in China over the past 40, 50, 60 years. Why? I think it's because the Chinese people, the Chinese Christians, believe in this idea of making disciples, disciples making other disciples. And I can't help but wonder what would happen to you and to me and to this community if we embraced this same idea, this same concept of discipleship, if we actually took Jesus' words seriously and acted upon them in our lives. So, so what does this mean? How do we do this? What's the secret sauce for making disciples? Jesus looks at the disciples and says, go and make disciples. And how do they do it? I think the answer is really in the simple words of how Jesus says it. He says, just go and make disciples. And they ask themselves, we're supposed to do this on our own. He says, no, I'm going to be with you to the very end of the age. I think it's the simplicity of this commandment to make disciples. And oftentimes, I don't know about you, but I can take something really simple and make it very, very complicated in my life. I can make things far too complicated in my life. When I was 12 or 13 years old, I don't exactly remember what it was, but there was a group of buddies and I, and and we were inner tubing down uh, the Turtle Creek. It was more of a river in southern Minnesota. And it was a hot summer day, and we had no cares in the world. And there we are floating down the Turtle Creek on our inner tubes. And off in the distance, we saw a rope, a really thick rope. And so, of course, we paddled to the side of the river. Now, this was no ordinary rope swing. This rope swing was attached way high up in a tree. And to get up there, you had to climb two by fours. There were about 20 two by fours that went way up in this tree. And we were an adventuresome group of young boys And so, of course, we climbed up this rickety ladder up into the tree. It was probably 30 feet up in the air. It was way high up in the trees. And we got up there, and we were all standing in the tree. And we were imagining what it would be like to swing out on this rope swing and land in Turtle Creek. But none of us wanted to try it. (laughs) Because we were high up in the air. And so we said, I know, let's, let's just swing the rope out and we'll time it and we'll count how many seconds it takes until that rope gets out to the river and then we'll just kind of figure that out. And so we did that and then we thought, well, what if there's somebody standing? Maybe, maybe it'll go faster. And so we, we tied a, a, a stick around it or a log or something because we wanted to see if it would go quicker and then we timed it again. And then we said, well, maybe if, you, you know, if we go at a certain angle off this way or this way, it'll impact what it's going to look like to go out, into, out, out over the river. And, and then what is the we, wind speed today? And we need to take that into consideration. We must have spent an hour thinking and analyzing and wondering how do we, and of course the, the bottom line is none of us have the courage to do it. And so we're analyzing and trying to figure out what is the best way to jump off this rope swing. Pretty soon, Dwayne, there's always a Dwayne in the group, right? (laughs) Dwayne said, I'll go first. And the rest of us kind of breathed a sigh of relief. And so in that moment, Dwayne grabbed a hold of the rope. He jumped off that tree branch. Ah! Splash. Dwayne popped up out of the water. He swam over to the shore and we're like, what, what you know what, what was the sauce? What, you know, the secret sauce? How did you do it? What was your technique? And Dwayne said, you just grab the rope and when you get over the water, you let go. 
Really? That simple? Yeah, it's that simple. And so for the rest of the afternoon, we took turns going off that mother of all rope swings out into the water. You know, as I think back over my life and those moments of just great wonder and excitement and adventure, I can think of a number of them. But on that list for sure is that day from the rope swing. And I remember how terrifying it was, how exciting, how exhilarating it was, but how scared I was and how all of us had taken something so simple and made it so complicated. I think on that day, we needed less information and more courage and faith to just go. And I think in our Christian discipleship, some of us are always looking for more information. We're looking for a methodology. We're looking for a special program about how do we do discipleship. And the truth is, I think discipleship is less about information. And it's more about faith and trust and courage and a willingness to just go. The British philosopher and writer... G.K. Chesterton, some of you might have heard of him, said, Christianity has not so much been tried and found wanting, it has been found difficult and left untried. You know, for the disciples, when Jesus came to them on that day and said, go and make disciples, They were terrified. It was the scariest thing that Jesus had ever asked them to do. Remember, all along, Jesus had been with them. They had their security blanket. Jesus says, I'm going away to the Father. Now you go and make disciples. And really what the disciples needed on that day and in the days ahead was less information and more faith and courage. To make it happen. And so this morning, as we open our Bibles to Matthew 4, I want us to hear again how did Jesus make disciples? What was his methodology? What was his secret sauce for making disciples? So, Matthew 4, beginning with verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. So how did Jesus make disciples? He simply invited them into an intentional relationship. It was all about relationship, wasn't it? So we think about how Jesus made disciples. It was all about going on a journey with people. It's inviting them. Hey, let's go on a journey together. Let's spend some time together. And for sure, that's what the disciples did for three years. They went on this camping trip with Jesus. Remember Jesus said, uh, foxes have dens, birds have nests. The Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. I've got nothing, guys. Let's go camping. (laughs) And so they did. They traveled around and they went camping and they spent time together and they went hiking up in the mountains and they went fishing out on the sea and they just spent time together. They did life together. And can you imagine going on a camping trip with Jesus? He performed miracles and they not not only got to witness these miracles, but they got to taste the fish of this abundant 
overflow of fish that came into the boat. And they heard these incredible teachings. They witnessed all sorts of miracles. And they spent time together and they would go through highs and lows together. And through it all, Jesus continued to just love them. And sometimes Jesus had hard words for the disciples, didn't he? He not only loved them for who they were and for as messed up as they were, but sometimes Jesus looked at the disciples and said, you know, you got it all wrong. Peter, you messed up again. What it means to disciple and how Jesus discipled his friends was he loved them. He cared for them in both grace and truth. Grace means I love you no matter what. And truth means I'm going to be honest with you no matter what. And that's what it means to disciple one another. is to love each other just as we are and to care for one another, but then also to speak the hard words of truth to one another. And when we do that, iron sharpens iron, and we become just a little bit more Christ-like. Now this morning, I want to put a little bit of flesh on this. What does this look like? Over the past few years, I've been told by a number of people in my own life, And one of the people who has discipled me over the past few years is John Petrillo. And John and I have spent time together over the past few years, and and we never signed up with a formal contract. I never asked him to sign on the dotted line or me on the dotted line. We just spent time together. We didn't have a curriculum. We didn't have a program. Most of the time, we didn't even have an agenda. We just get together and we'd share life. We'd share stories about our marriages, about our foibles raising kids, about our ways in which we messed up in all sorts of relationships at work, out in the community, many of the dumb things that we've done. And then most of it, which is a lot. <laughs> And then most of the time, we would just spend a lot of time laughing together. Because he would look at me and say, oh, I can top that one. (laughs) And we go back and forth, sharing life together. And John would pray with me. And John would encourage me. In fact, a few months ago, when I had a lot of self-doubt in my life, John believed in me more than I believed in me. John's dad was a pastor. And so we talk about vocation and ministry. I think John just gets me. And so he would pour into me. And he loved on me and cared for me. But John also spoke words of truth to me. He wasn't all love. He was also truth. And he would say, you know what, Brian, sometimes maybe this is what you did wrong. Maybe you could have done this better. He spoke some words to me that I needed to hear. And that's how John has been discipling me. So my question for you this morning is who's discipling you? Who is pouring into your life in a spiritual way. Who is loving you in the name of Jesus Christ just as you are, but also who is loving you with both grace and truth and willing to speak those hard words of I'm going to be honest with you no matter what. Who's discipling you? Because we all need people intentionally pouring into our lives. Discipleship does not happen without intentionality. And so we need to seek out those relationships of people pouring into our lives, speaking to us in grace 
and truth. Jesus poured into a handful of guys. Of course, time and time again, Jesus would stand before the crowds, before the masses, and he would teach great big groups of people, sometimes 5,000 people. But at the end of the day, Jesus focused on just a couple handful of men and women. And he said, these are the people that I'm going to pour my life into. These are the people that I'm going camping with. These are the people that I'm going to share my life with. And so who are you sharing your life with? Who are those people that are pouring into you? But I also want to ask you, who are you pouring into? Who are you discipling? Who are those people in your life that when you need help, or they need help, that you show up and walk alongside them? Who are you intentionally investing in? I think for many of us, discipleship begins with those closest to us. And for many of us, that means our families, our immediate families. So maybe it's your kids. Maybe those people that you need to be pouring into are living under your roof. Your children. Maybe your grandkids. Those that you see very regularly. This past week, we began to have some conversation about starting uh, some programming for our children and our youth ministry here at Faith Lutheran Church. And we're going to do confirmation and we're going to do children's ministry and senior high ministry. And we're going to do all those things. But I want to be very, very clear. It is the job, it is the role, it is the responsibility of moms and dads to first pour into their kids. It's not the church's responsibility to raise kids in the faith of Jesus Christ. It's moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. It's my responsibility to pour into my own kids faith and to disciple them first. Now, I will tell you, we will take help from the church. In fact, we will take all the help we can from the church. Making disciples is not a solo sport. It's a team sport, right? And so we do these things to add an extra layer. We do this because moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, we need help in raising our young people in the faith of Jesus Christ. And so moms and dads, we should not abdicate our role, our responsibility. But we are primary when it comes to pouring into the lives of our young people in growing faith. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? To make disciples of our young people. So my question for you again this morning is who are you pouring into? Who are you helping to grow into a follower of Jesus? Who are you helping to become more like Jesus? Who's pouring into you? And who are you pouring into? See, if we are not intentional about making disciples, about being poured into and pouring into others, then we are not following the Great Commission. It really is that simple. The church does not automatically grow. People do not automatically grow in their faith. It takes intentionality on your part and my part for us to truly make disciples. And so this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to receive, being poured into, but then also to pour into others. And let's not make this too complicated, folks. You don't need to go to Ecuador, although we're glad some of you go to Ecuador. Did you guys get sick this year, by the way? No? No sickness. Oh, you did. Okay, there you go. Last summer, my son went, and oh boy, did he get sick. You can make disciples right here in this community, right? 
Wherever you are going, whatever you are doing, that is where God has called you to make disciples. It's doing what you do with love and with excellence. It's when you go to work. It's showing just a little bit more love to those around you. Why? Because Christ first loved you. And when people see that you are more loving, they'd be like, I wonder what's up with that person. They seem a little bit different. It really is about doing what you do with intentionality in both love and excellence. That's what it means to make disciples. There's probably lots of other things that are involved. But I want you to hear this morning, it really all boils down to intentionally loving others and doing things with excellence. In fact, I ran across a great Martin Luther quote this, um, this past week that I want to share with you all. Martin Luther once said, The Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but rather by making good shoes. Because God is interested in good craftsmanship. So whatever you're doing, do it with excellence, intentionality, and do it with love. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you. That the Great Commission truly is that simple of intentionally allowing others to pour into our lives and intentionally pouring into others in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we confess that oftentimes we make discipleship way too complicated but it really is all about relationships. Relationship with you, relationships with one another. Lord, equip us and empower us to be people of the Great Commission. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.